In this first part of the lesson, we're going to discuss the three areas of employment law. There are three different areas of employment law that govern your relationship with your employer. They are common law, statutory employment legislation, and if you are a unionized employee, collective bargaining legislation, and labor arbitration. Let me walk through these briefly. The first regime of employment law is common law. We sometimes call this case law or judge-made law. It's important to note that the rights and obligations of employees and employers are determined by the terms of the employment contract. However, often many times when we're working, there is no written employment contract. And sometimes even if there is a written contract, the terms can be vague or they don't necessarily address all situations. In those cases, it's common for disagreements to arise between employees and the companies that they work for. When a dispute arises about the meaning or the application of an employment contract that is either written or implied, either party can file a lawsuit in the courts and ask a judge and sometimes a jury, depending on the severity of the case, to decide what the contract means or how it was intended to apply in a particular circumstance. The judge's decisions are recorded in law books and considered in future disputes that involve similar cases. Over time, a huge body of case law has been compiled that considers the meaning and application of employment contracts to an endless variety of employment scenarios. This body of law is known as the common law of employment. It's important to note that common law does not apply to collective agreements. We're going to talk more about those in just a few minutes. Common law judges have developed a long list of implied contract terms through the judgments that they've made over the years that are incorporated into all employment contracts, unless there is a written term in a specific contract that overrides this implied term. For example, probably the most well-known implied term is the requirement of both the employer and the employee to give reasonable notice when they are terminating the employment contract. You may have heard, for instance, that you need to provide two weeks notice if you're breaking the employment contract. That would be something that common law judges have ruled upon many times in the past. But there's also a long list of other important terms that courts have implied into employment contracts. That include things, like I just mentioned, the right to provide reasonable notice by both the employer and the employee if they are terminating the contract. The obligation of the employer to maintain a safe workplace. The obligation of the employer to treat employees with decency, civility, respect, and dignity at all times. Common law also lays out that we as the employee have some obligations to our companies that we work for. For instance, we have an obligation to serve our employer with loyalty and fidelity, to perform our job competently, to advance our employer's economic interest, and to avoid insubordination and insolence. The second regime of employment law is the statutory employment legislation. You may have heard of the Employment Standards Act, the ESA. This provides a minimum standard for most employees working in Ontario, and it includes things like employment equity legislation, human rights legislation, and minimum standards when it comes to things like minimum wage, maximum hours of work, overtime pay, and also includes occupational health and safety legislation. So again, it's important to note these are minimum standards set out by the Employment Standards Act. Let's talk for a few seconds about these minimum standards. In the news over the last few years, there's been much debate and discussion about this increase in minimum wage in Ontario. Remember, statutory employment legislation provides a minimum standard that employers and employees must follow. Tim Hortons is a Canadian institution, and when the increase in minimum wage from $11.60 to $14 an hour was instilled, they reduced employee benefits, took away tips and other incentives in response to this increase of $2.40 an hour. Let's do the math for a second. 
the old minimum wage of $11.60 an hour. If you're working a standard full-time work week, you're working 37 and a half hours a week. So doing the math, that's $435 a week before any income tax is taken off. At the new minimum wage of $14 an hour, working 37 and a half hours a week, you have $525 a week before taxes. So if I multiply each of those by four, the monthly income at the old minimum wage was $1,740 a month. At the new minimum wage is $2,100. Now, let's assume that you're paying 15% income tax, which is the minimum amount of income tax that someone pays in Ontario. At $1,740 a month, minus 15% income tax, that means that someone is walking away with money in their pocket of $1,479 per month. At the new minimum wage of $2,100 minus the 15%, they walk away with $1,785 a month in their pocket. Remember, they're working full-time hours to earn this money. I pose this question as a what do you think? Because just for a second, think about how much it costs to pay rent in, let's say, Oshawa or the greater Toronto area. I would guess that most people are paying at least $1,000 a month for rent for a fairly small apartment or even a room. It's because last week we talked about corporate social responsibility and being a good corporate citizen. And Tim Hortons, although they are a Canadian institution, I just want to pick on them for just a few minutes here. Tim Hortons holds themselves up as someone who gives back greatly to the community. They certainly sponsor things like Tim Bits Hockey, Tim Hortons has a camp day and their own children's foundation, and you may have heard of the Smile Cookie, where all of the proceeds go to great causes. But if we're talking about good corporate social responsibility, then how can a company claw back additional benefits when they're forced to increase the amount of money that they're paying their employees? Remember, statutory employment legislation or the Employment Standards Act provides a minimum standard for people working in Ontario. When that minimum standard was increased, Tim Hortons took away additional benefits to some of their employees. It's something for you to think about when you think about being a good corporate citizen. The third regime of employment law is collective bargaining and arbitration law. It's important to note some crucial differences between the rules that govern unionized and non-unionized workplaces in Canada. The contract that is negotiated in, in a unionized workplace is known as a collective agreement, and common law of employment does not apply to a collective agreement. Therefore, the implied terms permitting an employer to terminate an employee by giving reasonable notice does not apply when the employees are unionized. This is an important difference between unionized and non-unionized workplaces. In a non-unionized environment, an employer can terminate an employee for any reason or no reason at all by simply giving a proper notice period. In a unionized environment, an employer needs what's called just cause to dismiss a worker unless the dismissal is due for purely economic reasons such as a permanent layoff. In other words, unlike a non-unionized employer, a unionized employer usually needs a valid reason to fire an employee. Another important difference between a collective agreement and an individual employment contract is the method of enforcement. A non-unionized employee must sue their employer in a court for breach of the employment contract. That process is often very costly and very time consuming. A unionized employee, on the other hand, must file a grievance alleging that the collective agreement has been violated and that grievance, if not settled or resolved, may be referred to a labor arbitrator instead of a court. Arbitration can typically be faster than a lawsuit and the costs are covered by the union as part of the benefit paid by the employees in the form of monthly union dues.